The Triumph of Industrial Capitalism, 1850 to 1890. Today we are going to discuss the way in which America transformed from a largely rural and agrarian past to an urbanized existence based around big business. We will study the lives of the working poor as well as the wealthy in order to more fully understand the way in which industrialization created and maintained class hierarchies between 1850 and 1890. Remember that there is a lecture guide that you may fill out while watching the lecture. This is not mandatory but may help you to remember the material later. Students must read the corresponding documents on the course webpage. In 1884, Rosa Casatari left the Italian village of Cugiano near Milan to meet her husband, Santino, a miner in Union, Missouri. Theirs had been an arranged marriage, and Rosa was reluctant to go, especially because she had to leave behind her infant son. It is wonderful to go to America, even if you don't want to go to Santino, Rosa's friends told her at the train station in Milan. You will get smart in America, and in America you will not be so poor. Along with millions of others, Rosa entered a stream of migrants coming from the far corners of Europe. In France, she embarked on a ship for America. All us poor people had to go down through a hole to the bottom of the ship, she remembered. But she was going to America, the country where everyone could find work, where wages were so high that no one had to go hungry, where all the men were free and equal, and where even the poor could own land. Rosa's first taste of America did not live up to such dreams. In New York, she was cheated and forced to make the long trip to Missouri with nothing to eat. When she arrived at the town of Union, she found a shabby collection of tents and shacks. Life in the mining camp lived up to her fears rather than her hopes. With no doctors or midwives available, Rosa gave birth to a premature child alone on the floor of her cabin. Santino was an abusive husband and a cruel father and Rosa had to supplement his earnings by cooking for 12 additional miners. Yet Rosa was impressed by many things about America. Poor people did not behave humbly in the presence of the rich, for example, and even in the difficult circumstances of the mining camp, Rosa became accustomed to wearing decent clothing and eating meat every day, things she could never do back in Europe. When Rosa discovered that her husband planned to spend all their savings to open a house of prostitution, she separated from Santino. With the help of her immigrant friends from Missouri, Rosa moved to Chicago with her two children. She took a job at a place called Hull House, where the social workers were so impressed by her life story that they wrote it down and published it as Rosa Cassatari's autobiography. Rosa was one of millions of men and women who were moving around the world in the late 19th century. They moved from the countryside to the city or from town to town. They moved from less developed regions to places where industrialization was well underway. The nerve center for all of the movement was a powerful core of industrial capitalist societies, and at the center of the core was the United States. Migrants were on a worldwide trek, but more of them came to the United States than any other nation. Perpetual human migration, global in its extent, had become a hallmark of the political economy of industrial capitalism. Common laborers moved from place to place because jobs were unsteady. Railroads hired construction workers who moved as the track was laid and had to find other work when the line was finished. African-American sharecroppers in the South moved at the year's end. Over time, they moved into cotton growing districts, into towns and cities or out of the South. White tenant farmers moved into mill towns. Native Americans were pushed off their lands throughout the Trans-Mississippi West, making room for a flood of white settlers. And all across America, the children of farmers abandoned the rural life. They went to mill villages and to huge cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. They went looking for work, and for most migrants, that meant working in a bureaucracy or under professional managers who controlled the work process. It meant working with new and complicated machines. It meant working with polluted air, dirty rivers, or spoiled land. Most of all, industrial capitalism meant wage labor. Working people had been freed from the things that had tied them to the land in other places and earlier times, such as feudal dues, slavery, and even independent farming. But wage labor released men and women to move about from community to community, from country to country, and finally from continent to continent. To watch Rosa Cassatari as she traveled from Cugiano to Missouri and then to Chicago is to witness one small part of a global process set in motion by the triumph of wage labor in the late 19th century. The economic history of the late 19th century was sandwiched between two great financial panics, one in 1873 and one in 1893. 
Both were followed by prolonged periods of high unemployment and led directly to tremendous labor unrest. The years between the two panics were marked by a general decline in prices that placed a terrible burden on producers. Farmers found that their crops were worth less at harvest time than they had been during planting season. Manufacturers increased production to maintain profits, but the more they produced, the lower the prices fell for their products. In search of an inexpensive workforce that could produce more for less, industrialists turned to an international labor market. Amidst financial panics and nationwide strikes, depressions and deflation, Americans experienced a dramatic economic transformation. When it was over, the United States had become the leading capitalist nation on the earth. In July of 1877, workers for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad struck. Within a few days, the strike spread to the Pennsylvania Railroad, the New York Central, the Great Western, and finally to the Texas Pacific. Governors issued orders for these strikers to disperse and asked for federal assistance when they refused. Federal troops were routed to major cities, leading to confrontation with workers that only fanned the flames of the insurrection even further. Merchants could not sell, manufacturers could not work, and banks could not lend. The country was on the verge of a panic. The strike in one key industry threatened an entire nation. This railroad strike of 1877 was fueled by an economic depression that began with the Panic of 1873 and spread throughout the developed world. The number of immigrants who had arrived in New York, 200,000 between 1865 and 1873, fell to less than 65,000 in 1877. Although employment recovered in the 1880s, prices and wages continued to fall. Then in 1893, another panic struck. Once again, several major railroads went bankrupt and more than 500 banks and 15,000 businesses shut down. From 1873 to 1896, a Great Depression blighted much of the globe. The world was shrinking and most Americans knew it. In 1866, a telegraph cable was laid across the Atlantic Ocean. From that moment on, Americans could read about events in Europe in the next morning's newspaper. Railroads slashed the distances that separated Eastern from Western Europe and the East Coast from the West Coast of the United States. Steamships brought distant ports into regular contact. Midwestern farmers sold their wheat in Russia. Chinese workers laid the tracks of the Union Pacific Railroad. Eastern Europeans worked in the steel mills of Pittsburgh. The political economy of capitalism was tying the world's nations together. The clearest sign of this linkage was the emergence of an international labor market. As economic change swept through the less developed parts of the world, men and women were freed from their traditional ties to the land and hurled into a global stream of wage laborers. Irish women went to work as domestic servants, African Americans took jobs as railroad porters, wage laborers built and maintained the transportation network, the steel mills, and the petroleum refineries, slaughtered beef in Chicago, sewed ready-made clothing in factories, and staffed department store sales counters. 19th century migrants tended to leave areas already in the grip of social and economic change. Rosa Cassatari, for example, had worked in a silk weaving factory in Italy. At first, the largest numbers immigrated from the most developed nations, such as Great Britain and Germany. Later in the century, as industrial, or agricultural revolution spread, growing numbers of immigrants came from Scandinavia, Russia, Italy, and Hungary. As capitalism developed in these areas, small farmers were forced to produce for a highly competitive international market. The resulting upheaval sent millions of rural folk into the worldwide migratory stream. Improvements in transportation and communication were a sign that capitalism was spreading. They also made migration easier. In 1856, more than 95% of immigrants came to America aboard sailing vessels. By the end of the century, more than 95% came in steamships. The Atlantic crossing took one to three months on a sailing ship, but only 10 days on a steamship. Beginning in the 1880s, fierce competition among steamship lines dramatically lowered the cost of a transatlantic ticket, making two-way movement easier. Many immigrants went back and forth across the Atlantic, particularly workers in the seasonal trades like construction. But the great migrations of the late 19th century were also related to political upheaval. In 
In China, for example, the Taiping Rebellion of 1848 was accompanied by an economic disaster rivaling the Irish potato famine of the same decade. The combination of economic and political disruption sent some 300,000 Chinese to the Pacific coast of North America between 1850 and 1882. They labored in mines and panned for gold, and large numbers of Chinese workers helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. Desperate for employment and willing to work for low wages, the Chinese soon confronted racist hostility from American and European workers. Union organizers in San Francisco argued that the Chinese threatened the labor interests of white workers. In 1882, Congress responded by passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, banning further immigration from China. A similar combination of economic and political forces lay beneath European immigration. The revival of employment in the 1880s brought with it a revival of movement. After 1890, immigration from northern and western Europe fell off sharply, as capitalist development made labor scarce in those areas. But by then, agrarian crisis and political disruption had set off a wave of immigration from eastern and southern Europe. In Austria-Hungary, for example, the Revolution of 1848 brought with it economic and political changes that resulted by the 1880s in a profound agrarian crisis. In southern Italy, citrus fruits from Florida and California arrived on the market, and protective tariffs thwarted the sale of Italian wines abroad. Desperate farmers from southern Italy started coming to the United States. Jewish immigration was propelled by a different combination of politics and economics. The assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 was followed by a surge of Russian nationalism. Anti-Jewish riots called pogroms erupted between 1881 and 1882, in 1891, and once again between 1905 and 1906. During these, countless Jews were massacred. Anti-Semitic laws forced Russian Jews to live within the so-called Pale of Settlement along Russia's western and southern borders, and the May Laws of 1882 severely restricted Russian Jews' religious and economic lives. In the 1880s, Russian Jews began moving to America in significant numbers. Most immigrants came to America looking for work. Some came with education and skills. Some were illiterate. Most came with little more than their ability to work, and they usually found their jobs through families, friends, and fellow immigrants. Letters from America told of high wages and steady employment. Communities of immigrant workers provided the information and the connections that newcomers needed. Large Scandinavian communities settled the Upper Midwest. The Chinese were concentrated on the West Coast. Some immigrants settled directly on farms, but the overwhelming number lived in cities. Between 1850 and 1900, the map of the United States was redrawn thanks to the appearance of dozens of new cities. Of the 150 largest cities in the United States in the late 20th century, 85 were founded in the second half of the 19th century. In 1850, the largest city in the United States was New York, with a population of just over half a million. By 1900, New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago each had more than a million residents. The industrial city was different from its predecessors. By the middle of the 19th century, the modern downtown was born, a place where people shopped and worked but did not necessarily live. Residential neighborhoods separated city dwellers from the downtown districts and separated the classes from one another. Streetcars and commuter railroads brought middle-class clerks and professionals from their homes to their jobs and back, but the fares were beyond the means of the working class. The rich built their mansions uptown, but workers had no choice but to remain within walking distance of their job in the city. As cities became more crowded, they became unsanitary and unsafe. Yellow fever and cholera epidemics were among the scourges of urban life in the 19th century. Fires periodically wiped out entire neighborhoods. In October 1871, much of Chicago went up in flames. Along with fires and epidemics, urban life was marred by poverty and crime. Beginning in New York in the 1880s, immigrants lived in a new kind of apartment building, the Dumbbell Tenement, a five- or six-story walk-up housing a huge concentration of people. Immigrant slums appeared in most major cities of America, as well as in mill towns and mining camps. In 1890, Jacob Rees published How the Other Half Lives, his famous expose of life in the immigrant slums of New York. He described a dark three-room apartment inhabited by six people. The two bedrooms were tiny, the beds nothing more than boxes filled with foul straw. Such conditions were a common feature of urban poverty in the late 19th century.
Yet during these same years, urban reformers set about to make city life less dangerous and more comfortable. Professional fire departments were formed in most big cities by the 1860s. Professional police departments appeared around the same time, greatly reducing urban violence. In 1866, New York City set up the first Board of Health. In the second half of the 19th century, American cities undertook the colossal task of making urban life decent and safe. To a large degree, they succeeded. Cities provided clean drinking water, efficient transportation, and great museums, public libraries, and parks. And so the city, which the Jeffersonian tradition had long associated with corruption and decay, was increasingly defended as an oasis of diversity and excitement. Annie Aitken, who moved from Scotland to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1840, would have agreed. She was prospering in the United States while her sister Margaret's family back in Scotland was sinking fast. Margaret's husband Will had been a traditional handloom weaver whose livelihood was destroyed by the rise of textile mills. With Aitken's encouragement, in 1848, Will and Margaret Carnegie and their two sons, Tom and Andrew, left Scotland and moved to Pittsburgh. Annie let her sister's family live rent-free in a small house that she owned. Her nephew, Andrew, took a job in a textile mill for $1.20 a week. Fifty years later, Andrew Carnegie sold his steel mills to J. Pierpont Morgan for $480 million. If you are interested in learning more about 19th century city life, you might consider watching the drama TV series Copper. The series is the first originally scripted program from BBC America, and it is set in 1860s New York City during the American Civil War. It stars Tom Weston Jones, an Irish immigrant policeman or copper, who patrols the Five Points neighborhood. The show is a surprisingly realistic portrayal of life in the 19th century, including a candid look into the sex industry, law and order, the political machine, developments in the medical practice, and forensics, as well as the rise of big business. It is currently available on Netflix. Before the Civil War, the only enterprises in the U.S. that could be called big businesses were the railroads. Indeed, railroads became the model for a new kind of business, big business, that emerged during the 1880s. Big businesses had massive bureaucracies that were managed by professionals rather than owners and were financed through a national banking system centered on Wall Street. They marketed their goods and services across the nation and around the world and generated wealth in staggering concentrations, giving rise to a class of men whose names, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Morgan, and Vanderbilt, became synonymous with American capitalism and wealth. Andrew Carnegie was an immigrant, whereas most businessmen were native-born. His childhood in Scotland was marked by poverty, whereas most of America's leading men of business were raised in relative prosperity. Certainly few working families in the late 19th century could hope to match his spectacular climb from rags to riches. Nevertheless, Andrew Carnegie was the perfect reflection of the rise of big business. In the course of his career, Carnegie mastered the telegraph, railroad, petroleum, iron, and steel industries, and introduced modern management techniques and strict accounting procedures to American manufacturing. Other great industrialists made their mark in the last half of the 19th century. Henry Clay Frick, Collis P. Huntington, George M. Pullman, John D. Rockefeller, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. But none of their lives took on the mythic proportions of the Scottish lad who came to America at the age of 12 and ended up the richest man in the world. I have made millions since, Carnegie once wrote, but none of these gave me so much happiness as my first week's earnings. Young Andrew might have been happy to earn a wage, but he was not content with his job in a mill. He enrolled in a night course to study accounting, and a year later got a job as a messenger boy in a telegraph office. So astute and hardworking was Andrew that by 1851 he was promoted to telegraph operator. In his dealings with the other operators, Carnegie soon displayed the leadership ability that served him throughout his career. He recruited talented, hardworking men and organized them with stunning efficiency. The most successful businessmen in Pittsburgh, such as Tom Scott, a superintendent for the Pennsylvania Railroad, noticed Carnegie's talents. In 1853, Scott offered Carnegie a job as his secretary and personal telegrapher. Carnegie stayed with the Pennsylvania Railroad for 12 years during a time when railroad construction soared. Railroads stood at the center of the booming industrial economy. They would become the steel industry's biggest customer, 
Petroleum refiners shipped their kerosene by rail. Mining corporations needed railroads to ship their coal and iron. Ranchers shipped their cattle by rail to the slaughterhouses of Chicago, and meat packers distributed butchered carcasses and refrigerated railroad cars. Thus, his position at the Pennsylvania Railroad gave Carnegie an unrivaled familiarity with the workings of big business. By the mid-1850s, the largest factory in the country, the Pepperell Mills in Biddeford, Maine, employed 800 workers, while the Pennsylvania Railroad had more than 4,000 employees. If the men who maintained the track fell down on the job, if an engineer arrived late, or if a fireman came to work drunk, trains were wrecked, lives were lost, and business failed. The railroads thus borrowed the disciplinary methods and bureaucratic structure of the military to ensure that the trains ran safely and on time. The man who introduced this organizational discipline to the Pennsylvania Railroad was Tom Scott, the man who had hired Andrew Carnegie. J. Edgar Thompson, the Pennsylvania Railroad's president, was a pioneer of a different sort. He established an elaborate bookkeeping system that provided detailed knowledge of every aspect of the railroad's operations. Scott used the statistics Thompson collected to reward managers who improved the company's profits and eliminate those who failed. Carnegie succeeded. After Scott was promoted to vice president in 1859, Carnegie took Spot Scott's place as superintendent of the Western Division, where he helped make the Pennsylvania Railroad into a model of industrial efficiency. By 1865, the Pennsylvania had 30,000 employees and had expanded its line east into New York City and west into Chicago. It was the largest private company in the world. Carnegie's experience at the Pennsylvania Railroad gave him a keen understanding of the modern financial system. Railroads dwarfed all previous business enterprises in the amount of investment capital they required and in the complexity of their financial arrangements. Railroads were the first corporations to issue stocks through sophisticated trading mechanisms that attracted investors from around the world. To organize the market in such vast number of securities, the modern investment house was developed. J. Pierpont Morgan grew rich selling railroad stocks. The House of Morgan prospered greatly from its association with Andrew Carnegie, for there was no shrewder investor in all of America. Carnegie began making money from money in 1856. On Tom Scott's advice, Carnegie borrowed $600 and invested it in Adams Express Company stock, which soon began paying handsome dividends. Carnegie had become a successful capitalist, and for the next 15 years, he made a series of financial moves that earned him several more fortunes. Carnegie invested in the Woodruff Sleeping Car Company in the late 1850s, and a decade later used his shares and influence to help George Pullman win near-monopoly control of the industry and make millions in the bargain. Carnegie brokered a similar deal that created the Western Union monopoly of the telegraph industry. He invested in an oil company in western Pennsylvania and demonstrated that strict management would produce steady profits. He made shady deals on the international financial markets. He made millions selling worthless bonds to naive German investors. More substantially, he created the Keystone Bridge Company, which built the first steel arch bridge over the Mississippi River and provided the infrastructure for the Brooklyn Bridge over New York's East River. With Keystone, Carnegie perfected a model of managerial organization that was the envy of the industrial world. By 1872, Carnegie was tired of financial speculation and ready for something new. He was 37 years old and had proven himself a master of the railroad industry, a brilliant man Manager and a shrewd financial manipulator. Now Carnegie wanted to create an industry of his own. My preference was always for manufacturing, he explained. I wished to make something tangible. He would make iron and steel. In 1865, Carnegie acquired a controlling interest in the Union Iron Company. Carnegie's first goal was to speed the flow of materials to his Keystone Bridge Company. This was an important innovation. Iron manufacturing in America had always been decentralized, with each stage of the production handled by a different manufacturer. But Carnegie forced Union Iron and Keystone Bridge to coordinate their operations, thereby eliminating middlemen and making production more efficient. Carnegie also forced Union Iron to adopt the managerial techniques and accounting practices he had learned at the Pennsylvania Railroad. 
By keeping a strict account of all costs, Carnegie could locate the most wasteful points in the production process and reward the most efficient workers. Because he knew exactly what his costs were, Carnegie figured out that his iron mill would be more profitable if he invested in expensive new equipment. He ran his furnaces at full blast, wearing them out after only a few years and replacing them with still more modern machines. Carnegie's great achievement was his introduction of modern management techniques to American industry. But it was in steel, rather than iron, that Carnegie would prove the worth of those techniques. As with so many industries, the development of steel was driven by the development of railroads. Traditional iron rails deteriorated rapidly, and as trains grew larger and heavier, iron withered under the load. J. Edgar Thompson, head of the Pennsylvania Railroad, began experimenting with steel rails in 1862. Steel was also a better material for locomotives, boilers, and railroad cars themselves. In the 1860s, two developments cleared the path for the transition from iron to steel. First, Henry Bessemer's patented process for turning iron into steel became available to American manufacturers. Second, iron ore began flowing freely onto the American market from deposits in northern Michigan. Andrew Carnegie was uniquely situated to take advantage of these developments. His experience with Union Iron taught him how to run a mill efficiently, and he had access to investment capital. In 1872, Carnegie built a steel mill, the Thompson Works. Despite a worldwide depression, the steel mill was profitable from the start. Carnegie was unusual among the industrial captains of his day because he preached for the rights of laborers to unionize and protect their jobs. However, Carnegie's actions did not always match his rhetoric. Carnegie steelworkers were often pushed to long hours and low wages. In the Homestead Strike of 1892, Carnegie threw his support behind plant manager Henry Frick, who locked out workers and hired Pinkerton thugs to intimidate strikers. Many were killed in the conflict, and it was an episode that would forever hurt Carnegie's reputation and haunt the man. Still, Carnegie's steel juggernaut was unstoppable, and by 1900, Carnegie Steel produced more of the metal than all of Great Britain. That was also the year that financier J.P. Morgan mounted a major challenge to Carnegie's steel empire. While Carnegie believed he could beat Morgan in a battle lasting 5, 10, or 15 years, the fight did not appeal to the 64-year-old man eager to spend more time with his wife, Louise, whom he had married in 1886, and their daughter, Margaret. Carnegie wrote the asking price for his steel business on a piece of paper and had one of his managers deliver the offer to Morgan. Morgan accepted without hesitation, buying the company for $480 million. Congratulations, Mr. Carnegie, Morgan said to him when they finalized the deal. You are now the richest man in the world. Fond of saying that the man who dies rich dies disgraced, Carnegie then turned his attention to giving away his fortune. He abhorred charity and instead put his money to use helping others to help themselves. That was the reason he spent much of his collected fortune on establishing over 2,500 public libraries, as well as supporting institutions institutions of higher learning. By the time Carnegie's life was over, he gave away $350 million. In 1889, Carnegie wrote The Gospel of Wealth, an article that described the responsibility of philanthropy by the new upper class of self-made rich. Carnegie proposed that the best way of dealing with the new phenomenon of wealth inequality was for the wealthy to redistribute their surplus means in a responsible and thoughtful manner. Carnegie also argued against wasteful use of capital in the form of extravagance, irresponsible spending, or self-indulgence, instead promoting the administration of said capital over the course of one's lifetime toward the cause of reducing the stratification between the rich and poor. As a result, the wealthy should administer their riches responsibly and not in a way that encourages the slothful, the drunkard, or the unworthy, he wrote. Carnegie also was one of the first to call for a League of Nations, and he built a palace of peace that would later evolve into the world court. His hopes for a civilized world of peace were destroyed, though, with the onset of World War I in 1914. Louise said that with these hostilities, her husband's heart was broken. Carnegie lived for another five years, but the last entry in his autobiography was the day that World War I began. In the late 19th century, the names of a handful of wealthy capitalists became closely associated with different industries. Gustavus Swift in meatpacking, John D. Rockefeller in oil refining, Collis P. Huntington in railroads, J.P. Morgan in financing, 
and Andrew Carnegie and Steele. These powerful individuals, sometimes called robber barons, represented a passing phase in the history of American enterprise. Most big businesses were so big that no single individual or family could own them. They were run by professionally trained managers, and the highest profits went to companies with the most efficient bureaucracies. Because the businesses were so big and their equipment was so expensive, they had to be kept in operation continuously. An average factory could respond to an economic slowdown by closing the doors for a while, but big businesses could not afford to do that. Beginning in the 1880s, big businesses developed strategies designed to shield them from the effects of ruinous competition. The most common strategy was vertical integration, the attempt to control as many aspects of a business as possible, from the production of raw materials to the sale of the finished product. Carnegie integrated the steel industry from the point of production forward to the distribution of steel, but also backward to the extraction of iron ore. He bought iron mines to produce his own ore and railroads to ship the ore to his mills and the finished product to the market. His Keystone Bridge Company then purchased the steel. In 1882, John D. Rockefeller devised a new solution to the problem of ruinous competition by forming the Standard Oil Trust. Rockefeller had funded Standard Oil in 1867 in Cleveland, Ohio. Like Carnegie, Rockefeller surrounded himself with the best managers and financiers to build and run the most efficient modern refineries. But he was more willing than Carnegie to use ruthless tactics to wipe out his competitors. Rockefeller extracted preferential shipping rates from the railroads, giving him a critical advantage in the savagely competitive oil business. In 1872, Rockefeller began imposing on the national oil refining industry the same control that he already achieved in Ohio. As president of the National Refiners Association, he formed cartels with the major operators in other states. But the cartels were too weak to eliminate independent refiners. Rockefeller, therefore, set out to control the entire oil industry by merging all of the major companies together under Standard Oil. By 1879, the Standard Oil monopoly was largely in place, but not until 1882 was it formalized as a trust, an elaborate legal device by which different producers came together under the umbrella of a single company that could police competition internally. In 1889, the New Jersey legislature passed a law that allowed corporations based in that state to form holding companies that controlled companies in other states. Thus, the trust gave way to the holding company, with Standard Oil of New Jersey as its most prominent example. Within a decade, many of the largest industries in America were dominated by massive holding companies. Rockefeller's Standard Oil monopoly was a notorious example of how big business had changed the American economy. Rockefeller himself came to represent a powerful new class of extraordinarily wealthy businessmen. Their names, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Morgan, Harriman, and others, soon became associated with the upper class of the new social order of industrial America. Classes were not supposed to exist in the United States the way they existed in Europe, as many Americans continued to believe in the late 19th century. Yet the reality of class divisions was so obvious that it had become part of public discussion. It was hard not to notice the conspicuous gap between the astonishing wealth of Andrew Carnegie and the daily struggles of Rosa Cassatari. Between 1850 and 1890, the proportion of the nation's wealth owned by the 4,000 richest families nearly tripled. At the top of the social pyramid rested some 200 families worth more than 20 million each. Concentrated in the Northeast, especially in New York, these families were known throughout the world for their astonishing wealth. Spread more evenly across America were several thousand millionaires whose investments in cattle, ranching, agricultural equipment, mining, commerce, and real estate made them wealthy capitalists. As a group, America's millionaires had a lot in common. Most traced their ancestry to Great Britain. Most were Protestant, usually Episcopalians, Presbyterians, or Congregationalists. By the standards of their day, they were unusually well-educated, except in the South. America's upper class voted Republican. The upper classes lived in a spectacular houses and neighborhoods that became famous for their wealth. Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, Knob Hill in San Francisco, Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, and Boston's Back Bay. Wealthy suburbs like Brooklyn,
Brooklyn Heights or Philadelphia's Main Line, acquired similar reputations as privileged retreats. The richest families also built rural estates that rivaled the country homes of England and the chateaus of France. In the late 19th century, the richest families built a string of spectacular summer homes along the Newport, Rhode Island shoreline. The leading figures in New York's high society competed with one another to stage the most lavish balls and dinner parties. The competition reached a climax on March 26, 1883, when Mrs. William Vanderbilt staged a stupendous costume ball that challenged Mrs. William Astor's long-standing position as the Queen of New York's upper class. The ball was a great success. All of New York society turned out at the magnificent Vanderbilt Mansion, where the hostess made a grand entrance dressed as a Venetian princess. It was left to the new middle class to preserve the traditional virtues of thrift and self-denial. In 1889, the Century Dictionary introduced the phrase middle class to the United States. The new term reflected a novel awareness that American society had become permanently divided in a way that earlier generations had stoutly denied. Professionals were the backbone of the new middle class that emerged in their 19th century. All professions defined what it meant to be a member of their tribe, organize themselves into professional associations and set educational standards for admission. By these means, professionals could command high salaries and enjoy both prestige and a comfortable standard of living. Between 1870 and 1890, some 200 societies were formed to establish the educational requirements and maintain the credentials of their members. Even the management of corporations became a professional occupation, as business schools were created to train professionals in the science of accounting and the art of management. Some professionals succeeded in having their standards written into law. In most states, by 1900, doctors and lawyers could practice legally only when licensed under the auspices of professional associations. Behind the new professional managers marched an expanding white-collar army of cashiers, clerks, and government employees. They were overwhelmingly men, and they earned annual incomes far beyond those of independent craftsmen and factory workers. As it developed, the middle class withdrew from the messy uncertainties of the central city. Improved roads and mass transit systems allowed middle class families to escape the urban extremities of great wealth and miserable poverty. Middle class residents idealized the physical advantages of trees, lawns, and gardens, as well as the comfortable domestic life that suburbs afforded. Only the most successful craftsmen matched the incomes and suburban lifestyles of white-collar clerks. Butchers might earn more than $1,600 annually, for example, but shoemakers average little more than $500. A shoemaker who owned his own tools and ran a small shop maintained the kind of independence that was long cherished among middle-class Americans, yet his income scarcely distinguished him from skilled factory workers. The manual crafts were therefore a bridge between the remnants of the independent middle class and the growing industrial working class made up of men and women like Rosa Cassatari. When I first went to learn the trade, John Morrison told a congressional committee in 1883, a machinist considered himself more than the average working man. In fact, he did not like to be called a working man. He liked to be called a mechanic. Morrison put his finger on one of the great challenges in the political economy of 19th century America. Before the Civil War, urban working men were skilled laborers who were referred to as artisans and mechanics. Today, Morrison explained, the mechanic is simply a laborer. Big businesses replace mechanics with semi-skilled or unskilled factory laborers. For traditional mechanics, this felt like downward mobility, but most factory operatives and common laborers were migrants or children of migrants from small towns and farms. Few, therefore, experienced factory work as degradation of their traditional skills, as John Morrison did. But most migrants did experience industrial labor as a harsh existence. Factory operatives worked long hours in a difficult condition, performing rep repetitious tasks with little job security. The clothing industry is a good example of the lives of urban workers. The introduction of the sewing machine in the 1850s gave rise to sweatshops, where work was subdivided into simple repetitive tasks. One group produced collars for men's shirts, another produced cuffs, and yet another stitched the parts together. Jobs were defined to ensure that workers could easily be replaced. Factory operatives learned this lesson quickly. 
They were young, often they were women or children, who moved into and out of different factory jobs with astonishing frequency. But even among men, factory work was at best unsteady. The business cycle swung hard and often, leaving few factory operatives with secure long-term employment. At the bottom of the hierarchy of wage earners were the common laborers, whose trademark was physical exertion. Their numbers grew throughout the century until by 1900 common laborers accounted for a third of industrial workforce. Hundreds of thousands of common laborers worked for railroads and steel companies. Before Andrew Carnegie and his competitors revolutionized their industry, for example, no more than 20% of iron and steel workers were common laborers. By the 1890s, 40% of steel workers were common laborers. Common laborers were difficult to organize into effective unions. A large proportion were immigrants and African Americans, and ethnic differences and language barriers often frustrated the development of workers' alliances. Even the kind of work common laborers performed inhibited the growth of effective unions. It was rarely steady work. Men who laid railroad tracks or dug canals and subway tunnels generally moved on when they finished. Common labor was often seasonal. As a result, unskilled workers changed jobs frequently. Common laborers were unusually mobile and easily replaceable, and they increasingly came from parts of the world where the idea of organized labor was unknown. Even when they did organize, common laborers faced the biggest, most powerful, most effectively organized corporations in the country. A great deal of the wage work done by women fell into the category of common labor. In 1900, women accounted for nearly one of every five gainfully employed Americans. They stood behind the counters of department stores, and young Irish women worked as domestics in northern middle-class homes. In the South, African-American women worked as domestics. A smaller proportion of women held white-collar jobs as teachers, nurses, or low-paid clerical workers and sales clerks. The same hierarchy that favored men in the white-collar and professional labor force existed in the factories and sweatshops. In the clothing industry, for example, units dominated by male workers were higher up the chain of command than those dominated by women. Indeed, as the textile industry became a big business, the proportion of women working in textile mills steadily declined. The reverse trend appeared among white-collar workers. As department stores expanded in the 1870s and 80s, they hired low-paid women, often Irish immigrants, with none of the prospects for promotion still available to men. White-collar work was not a signal of middle-class status for women as it was for most men in the late 19th century. The story was somewhat different for married women and their children. As few as 1 in 50 working-class wives and mothers took jobs outside the home. Women supplemented the family income by taking in boarders or doing laundry. Most often, however, working-class families survived by sending their children to work. Even in the families of the highest paid industrial workers, 50% of the children worked. Among the poorest working class families, three out of four children worked. Child labor was a clear sign of class distinction. The rich sent their daughters to finishing schools and their sons to elite boarding schools. Middle class parents sent their children to public schools and working class families sent their children to work. The Homestead Act, passed by Congress during the Civil War, was designed to ensure that the West would be settled by hard-working, independent small farmers, and millions of farmers actually did settle in the West during the second half of the 19th century. Their movement has become the stuff of legend. But these hardy individuals did not settle an empty prairie. Waiting for them in the West were native people, some helpful, but many hostile, and far from escaping the hierarchy of industrial capitalism, the settlers brought it with them. By the time the director of the U.S. Census declared the frontier closed in 1890, the political economy of the American West was composed of railroad tycoons and immigrant workers, commercial farmers, and impoverished Native Americans. Left home this morning, Jane Gold wrote in her diary on April 27, 1862. Along with her husband Albert and their two sons, Jane loaded a covered wagon in Mitchell, Iowa, and joined a group of migrants on the Overland Trail to California. It would be a long and difficult journey. Albert got sick shortly after they left, and Jane had to nurse him, drive the wagon, and care for the children. The further they traveled, the more distressed Jane became. The Overland Trail was littered with the remnants of wagon trains that had gone before, including discarded furniture, dried bones, and lonely graves. In early October, the Golds reached their new home in San Joaquin Valley. Five months later, Jane's husband died.
A popular image pictures the West as a haven for rugged men who struck out on their own, but most migrants went in family groups after the mid-19th century, and the families were mostly middle class. Few poor people could afford the expense of the journey and still hoped to buy land and set up farm in the West. The journey across the Overland Trail became safer over the years. In the late 1840s, the U.S. government began building forts along the Overland routes. Besides protecting migrants from Indians, the forts became resting points for wagon trains. By the 1850s, Mormon settlers in Utah had built Salt Lake City into a major stopping point. Migrants came to rely on the facilities there to ease the journey. Also, during the 1850s, the government began to pursue a long-term solution to the growing problem of Native American and white relations in the West. In 1851, more than 10,000 Native Americans from across the Great Plains converged on Fort Laramie in the Wyoming Territory. All the major Native people were represented, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Crow, and many others. They came to meet with government officials who hoped to develop a lasting means of avoiding Native American and white conflict. Signed on April 29th of 1868, the treaty guaranteed to the Lakota ownership of the Black Hills and further land and hunting rights in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. Finally, it opened the Powder River country to Native Americans only and henceforth closed it to all white settlement. From the start, the reservation system was corrupt and difficult to enforce. Agents for the Bureau of Indian Affairs cheated natives and the government alike, sometimes reaping huge profits. But primarily, the reservations failed because not all Indians agreed to restrict themselves to their designated territories, leading to armed confrontations and reprisals. By the late 1860s, the tension between natives and whites was at a fever pitch, as Senator James R. Doolittle of Wisconsin discovered on a fact-finding mission through the West. In Denver, he asked an audience of whites whether they preferred outright extermination of the Indians to a policy of restricting them to reservations. The crowd roared its approval for extermination. Army officers agreed. The government must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, declared General William Tecumseh Sherman. Senator Doolittle and his colleagues resisted the calls for extermination, opting instead for a more comprehensive reservation policy. The government pursued this approach by means of two important treaties that divided the Great Plains into huge Indian territories. The Medicine Lodge Treaty, signed in Kansas in October 1867, organized thousands of natives across the Southern Plains. In return for government supplies, most of the Southern Plains people agreed to restrict themselves to the reservation. The Northern Plains Indians did not sign on to the reservation so readily. A treaty was drafted, but a band of holdouts demanded further government concessions. Inspired by their leader, Red Cloud, the Indians insisted that the United States forces abandon their forts along the Bosman Trail. When the government agreed, Red Cloud finally signed the Fort Laramie Treaty in November of 1868. Red Cloud respected the treaties for the rest of his life, but nevertheless, they failed. Most white settlers still preferred extermination to reservations, and not all of the Plains Indians approved of the treaties, nor did the U.S. Army abide by the reservation policy. Within weeks of Red Cloud's signature on the Fort Laramie Treaty, for example, the 7th Cavalry, led by Colonel George Armstrong Custer, massacred Cheyennes at Washita, Oklahoma on November 27, 1868. As long as the United States Army sustained the settlers' hunger for extermination, Indian policy was made on the battlefield rather than in the government offices. By 1870, it was clear that Western Indians would not voluntarily retire to reservations and that the military could not force them into surrender. If any further evidence of the Indian resistance was needed, it came in South Dakota, where after discovery of gold in the Black Hills, thousands of whites poured onto Indian territory. When the Lakota Sioux rejected demands that they cede their lands to the miners, the government sent in the army, led by General Custer, who was an arrogant man, and he made two critical mistakes. First, he divided his army in two, and then he failed to keep them in communication with each other. Custer and hundreds of his men were slaughtered at Little Bighorn, Montana in 1876 by 2,000 Indian warriors led by Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse.
Custer's last stand did not signal any change of fortunes for the Plains Indians. By the 1870s, whites had learned that they could undermine Native American society most effectively by depriving Indians of their sources of subsistence, especially the bison. Kill every buffalo you can, a United States Army colonel urged one hunter. Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. Federal authorities did not actually sponsor the mass killing of the bison, they merely turned a blind eye. Railroads joined the process, sponsoring mass kills from slow-moving trains as they crossed the prairies. Some 13 million bison in the 1850s were reduced by 1880 to only a few hundred. With their subsistence destroyed, Chief Sitting Bull and his starving men finally gave up in 1881. The Sioux War ended in 1890 with a shocking massacre of 200 Native American men, women, and children at the Battle of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. In the Northwest in 1877, the Nez Perce, fleeing from Union troops, set out on a dramatic trek across the mountains into Yellowstone in an attempt to reach Canada. The Nez Perce eluded government troops and nearly made it over the Canadian border. However, hunger and the elements did what the Union Army had failed to do. Chief Joseph and his exhausted people agreed to go to their reservations. Reformers who advocated reservations over extermination always believed that the natives should be absorbed into the political economy of capitalism. By confining the Indians to reservations, explained William P. Dole, Lincoln's Commissioner of Indian Affairs, they are gradually taught and become accustomed to the idea of individual property. Most white settlers considered Native Americans an inferior race worthy of destruction. By contrast, Dole believed that Indians were capable of attaining a high degree of civilization. But reformers like Dole equated civilization with the cultivation of individual property. Accordingly, reformers set out to destroy Native American society. They introduced government schools on Indian reservations to teach children the virtues of private property, individual achievement, and social mobility. Ability. The reformers' influence peaked in 1887 when Congress passed the Dawes Severalty Act, the most important piece of Indian legislation of the century. Under the terms of the Dawes Act, land within the reservations was broken up into separate plots and distributed among individual families. The goal was to force natives to live like stereotypical white farmers, but the lands allotted were generally so poor and the plots so small that their owners sold them as soon as they were allowed. By the early 20th century, there were virtually no reservations left except for a few parcels in the desert southwest. With the Indians subdued, the path was cleared for the capitalist transformation of the West. A few hundred civilians died in Indian attacks during the late 19th century. More than 5,000 died building the railroads. Lawless violence and wild speculation were very much a part of the Western experience, as were struggling families, temperance reformers, and hard-working immigrants. By 1900, the West provided Americans with the meat and bread for their dinner tables, the wood that built their homes, and the gold and silver that backed up their currency. The West was being drawn into the political economy of global capitalism. The Trans-Mississippi West was no Garden of Eden waiting for lucky farmers to move in and reap the land's abundant riches. The climate, particularly in the Great Plains and the desert southwest, was too dry for most kinds of farming. The sod on the plains was so thick and hard that traditional plows ripped like paper and only steel would do the job. With little wood or stone to build houses, farmers lived first in dugouts or sod houses. Fierce winter blizzards gave way to blistering summers, each rocked by harsh winds. Yet settlers seemed determined to overcome and to overwhelm nature itself. To build fences where wood was scarce, manufacturers invented barbed wire. Windmills dotted the prairie to pump water from hundreds of feet below ground. Powerful agricultural machinery tore through the earth, and new strains of wheat from Europe and China were cultivated to withstand the brutal climate. The western environment was transformed. Wolves, elk, and bear were exterminated as farmers brought in pigs, cattle, and sheep. Tulare Lake, covering hundreds of square miles of California's Central Valley, was sucked dry by 1900. Hydraulic mining sent tons of earth and rock cascading down the rivers flowing out of the Sierra Nevada, raising water levels to the point where entire cities became vulnerable to flooding. The skies above Butte, Montana turned gray from the pollutants released by the copper smelting plants. Shepherding destroyed the vegetation on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada.
By the turn of the century, the bison had all but disappeared, and the Indians had been confined to reservations. Industrial mining corporations, profitable cattle ranches, and mechanized farms were now dominating the West. The frontier was gone, and in its place were commercial farms whose lives were shaped by European weather, eastern mortgage companies, commodity brokers, and railroad conglomerates. Cowboys sold their labor to cattle companies owned by investors in Boston and Glasgow. Mining and lumber corporations employed tens of thousands of wage laborers. Big cities sprang up almost overnight. San Francisco had 5,000 inhabitants in 1850, and by the time the gold rush was over in 1870, there were 150,000 people living there. Denver was incorporated in 1861, but its population hovered at just below 5,000 until the railroad came in 1870. Twenty years later, Denver had more than 100,000 inhabitants. Whatever it was in American mythology, the West was well on its way to becoming a part of an urban industrial nation. Rosa Cassatari and Andrew Carnegie never met, but together their lives suggest the spectrum of possibilities in industrializing America. Both were immigrants who, caught up in the political economy of industrial capitalism, made their way to the United States. Yet the same grand forces touched the two immigrants in different ways. Cassatari moved to a mining camp west of the Mississippi River before making her way to Chicago, the city that opened the West to the dynamism of industrial capitalism. Carnegie migrated almost overnight from the pre-industrial world of Scotland to the heart of the Industrial Revolution in America. Pittsburgh, with its railroads, oil refineries, and steel mills. Cassatari struggled all her life and achieved a modest level of comfort for herself and her children. She did as well as most immigrants could hope for, and in that sense, her biography reflects the realities of working class life in industrial America. Cassatari's experience with failure, the harsh life of the mining camp, and a bad marriage impelled her to move on in search of something better. It was success, however, that made Carnegie itch for something different. By 1890, having made his millions, he remade himself by becoming a patron of culture. He moved to New York and traveled the world, befriending the leading intellectuals of his day. He built libraries and endowed universities. He had helped create an industrial nation. Now he set out to recreate American culture.